Okay, let's get this party started. Um, it's week nine, second to the last week, and I'm very excited. As uh, you, your powers are coming fully online now, and you will be able to do really amazing things. Uh, today, we're going to take the basic uh, varying effect strategy, multi-level model strategy, and extend it into more dimensions, uh, and that'll require some new concept formation uh, and only a few new coding tricks. Um, and what it's going to unleash for you is the ability to do lots of scientifically uh, useful things. Okay, so to remind you, last week was all about <coughs> varying intercepts, the simplest sort of multi-level model and varying intercepts models as pictured on the top part of this slide. The, the notion is that the averages differ by cluster. And that cluster could be a chimpanzee, a block, uh, a department, whatever. There's some average rate of a thing that happens or some average value. And we want to consider that those averages differ. So this could be like the survival probability of tadpoles, right? And those survival probabilities differ on average across tanks. If we estimate them with pooling, we get better estimates, right? It's a, pooling estimators are biased estimators, but they're better than unbiased estimators. Right? So say, I guess some of you may know this terminology that I try to avoid about biased and unbiased estimators. So this is thing, um, linear regression is the best linear unbiased estimator. Blue, sometimes people call it blue, best linear unbiased estimator. But there are an infinite number of estimators that beat it and they're all biased. Uh, in, in statistics, unbiased is not a good thing, right? So one data point is an unbiased estimate of the mean of a normal distribution, uh, but it's probably not good to bet on exactly that value, right? Uh, so that's the thing about bias and unbiased. So by being biased, uh, we get better estimates out of sample, right? That was the whole point about overfitting. So that's varying intercepts, and that's all the partial pooling and all the wonderful stuff that you absorbed last week. Uh, we can extend this strategy, of course, to the sorts of parameters that we normally call slopes. Uh, what are slopes? Slopes are treatment effects. Uh, so it's another feature of each unit, how that feature responds to some treatment that you subjected to, how a chimpanzee responds to the presence of a partner. That would be a slope uh, or a treatment effect. And of course, we can distinguish those among the clusters as well and apply partial pooling and get better estimates on average, just as before. Uh, so these are things are often called varying slopes, where we allow the effects of a predictor variable to vary by cluster as well. And I tried to show this in the uh, lower plot on this slide. In the upper plot, you just have varying intercepts. So uh, across some predictor variable on the horizontal in this graph. Each line is a different cluster, like a different chimpanzee or tank. Um, they have different heights because their intercepts are different. Those are varying intercepts. But they all have, they're parallel to one another because they all have the same response, according to the model, to the treatment, to the x-axis variable. Does that make sense? And in the lower one, we let the slopes vary uh, by the unit as well. And then you get lots of fun, right? You get, you get a Jackson Pollock painting, right? If anybody remembers Jackson Pollock. Uh, yeah, okay, somebody, thank you. <laughs> um, and uh, uh, so we want to do this quite often. We want to let the data tell us how much variation there is, but we want to use partial pooling because we don't want to overfit each cluster. Same kind of story. Um, there are lots of uh, uh, domain-specific scientific reasons to consider varying slopes. Uh, just run through a few uh, with you to, to anchor your memory. Um, if you're trying to study how people respond to some pharmaceutical intervention, usually called a drug, like aspirin, right, uh, paracetamol, something like that, um, different people respond to different pain relievers in different ways. This is well known, right? Uh, not everybody responds to paracetamol in the same way or ibuprofen. Some people get very little therapeutic benefit for some particular pain reliever, but that doesn't mean the pain reliever doesn't work, <laughs> right? So the variation in the population is a very important thing to study. There could be zero average therapeutic response to a pain reliever, but some people could benefit hugely from it. Right? And there's this whole industry called precision medicine now, which is trying to leverage this. Um, uh, there are lots of educational interventions that are meant to help uh, students learn, uh, like after school programs. Uh, in North America, there was a period of time uh, about 20 years ago where after school programs were really popular kind of intervention. And it turns out not everybody benefits from them, but some people do. So looking at the average effect is not really the causal effect that you're interested in. And uh, of course, all of these things arise because not every unit in the population has the same relationship to the predictor variable. There are interactions. 
Uh, and this variation is important for understanding the causal, causal pathways that we're trying to intervene on. Um, okay, statistically, the major uh, uh, innovation, conceptual innovation that you're gonna have to confront, and we'll deal with this for the rest of the lecture today, is that what you could do with varying slopes is you could treat them exactly the same as varying intercepts. Now you've got another adaptive prior for the slopes, uh, and it's got some mean, and it's got some, which is the average treatment effect, say, and it's got some sigma, which is its variation, and run the model, and that works, and that works fine. But you can do even better than that by relating the intercepts to the slopes. So I'll say this again. You could treat the slopes as just like another varying intercept, statistically, just have a copy of the adaptive prior, relabel the parameters, now you've got an average slope and a variance among the slopes, and that'll work. That's not bad, but you can do better than that. You can do better than that by noticing that the intercepts and the slopes are related in the population. When you learn about the intercept of a unit, you often get information about its slope and vice versa. They're not disrelated things. Why not? Because they're lines. And when you change the slope of a line, you change its intercept. Yeah? I know that's a very mathematical version of it. There are real causal reasons that those parameters are related, but it shows up in the geometry that we represent it with. Uh, and so you want to think now about a single prior, and I'll show you what this looks like when we get to the mathematics, a single prior that has both the intercepts and the slopes inside of it. Uh, we're going to have a population of features of the units. As I call them on the slide, uh, there are all the units in the data, whether they're chimpanzees or, or tanks of tadpoles or schools or, or what have you, they have a bunch of features that we could list. And there's a correlation structure among these features because causal processes generate correlations among features in individual units. And um, that correlation structure lets you transfer information across the features, right? So if it, I'll have an example of this on the following slides, but the basic idea is think about your friends or your family. Right? There's a correlation structure among their personality characteristics and their hobbies. Or say that, say that I learned that Brendan likes death metal. Right? <laughs> and, sorry, did I just out you? <laughs> no. <laughs> but Brendan likes death metal. And you're not the only one in the room, I can tell. <laughs> but uh, uh, there are immediately lots of other things you're thinking about Brendan now, right? <laughs> there are other things that you, that you expect Brendan to like or not. You can ask him after class if you want. And, uh, so that's the correlation structure. And in a, in a statistical model, that's pooling. Uh, you get information about another type of parameter by learning the value of, another t of one type. Right? This is the feature relationship. And so you don't only pool within parameter types, between the intercepts, but also between intercepts and slopes. And then you get even better uh, uh, reduction in overfitting. OK, let me give you a toy example of this graphically. And then we'll actually work it up in a real statistical model with some data. Um, I want you to think back to the cafe example from last week. I introduced varying intercepts by asking you to imagine you're visiting, because uh, you're all you know, very fashionable globetrotters, you're visiting a bunch of the hippest cafes in Europe, and you, know, you visit a cafe in Paris, and you order some coffee, and you time how long it takes you to get that coffee, and you go to one in Berlin. Before you order your coffee in Berlin, you have a prior. And then this is a story that leads us to pooling, because the order you visit the cafe shouldn't matter. As soon as you get that coffee in Berlin, you should also update your estimate for Paris, even though you left it behind. And that's how pooling works. It's time invariant. You pool information across all the units until the sample size within each unit dominates the population inference. Um, now let's imagine, to extend this example a bit further, imagine now you're all clever engineers. We're going to program a robot to visit cafes and collect data. And the robot is your statistical model. Right? And how should you program this robot to learn from visits to cafes and ordering coffees and estimating the waiting times. Uh, what we're going to add to this story now is that the robot is going to visit in the morning and the afternoon, and it's going to distinguish between the two. It's going to keep track of the time of day. And, and uh, because all of you probably have visited a cafe in your life, you know that cafes are busier in the morning than they are in the afternoon, at least most of them, And uh, people get their coffees. Um, so the average wait time uh, at, say, 9 AM is longer than the average wait time at, say, 2 p.m. in a cafe. And uh, so we want to make this distinction. So now we have two parameters to estimate for each cafe, the wait time in the morning. And I'm going to code this as the difference between the morning and afternoon wait times will be the second parameter. So it looks like a slope. Okay. You could think of this as two different intercepts. And the problem is actually isomorphic. 
Are you with me so far? This is just the setup for what we're going to do. These two things are related, uh, I assert, by the causal process of the popularity of cafes. <laughs> right? Uh, and we'll, we'll talk this through as we go. Let me show it to you. Uh, well, I was going to say, on this slide, uh, this, is, this is toy data on the right to see two different cafes. At the top one, we have, have Cafe A, which is a, a popular cafe. The average wait time on the vertical axis is high. And in the points that are joined by a line segment, that's from morning to afternoon on the same day. So you see in the morning, you can expect to wait longer. In the afternoon, a little less. But if you compare this to Cafe B, which is in a, a part of town no one visits, uh, the wait times are shorter. You get your coffee instantly. Um, both wait times are shorter, but the difference between morning and wait time is much, much smaller in Cafe B, right? Because there's no morning saturation effect in Cafe B, right? You're not waiting in the morning, you're not waiting in the afternoon, you're just getting your coffee. We'll still misspell your name, but they'll, they'll get your coffee right away, right? Okay. So think about this statistically now. We've got some statistical population of cafes pictured in the middle here. And in this population, there's a correlation, a negative correlation, between the intercept, that is uh, uh, the average wait time in the morning, standardized in this example, so the mean is zero, and the slope, uh, which is the difference between the morning and the afternoon. So since there's a negative correlation in this cloud, think about how to interpret that for cafes with high intercept values, they have lower slopes. So what does that mean? That the difference is smaller between the morning and afternoon. Yeah? And, and the other way around. Uh, so there are two sets of, of uh, parameters, the intercepts and slopes, that we need to estimate. Um, and you could treat them as completely separate from one another. But if you, ignore, if you do that, you ignore this correlation, and the correlation gives you info. So now we're going to get some data from this population. And I'll show you how to run it as a statistical model and show you the value of, a, of measuring the correlation between the two. So the agent of our pooling now is going to be um, a prior distribution that is a two-dimensional Gaussian. And we're going to have both kinds of parameters, intercepts and slopes, inside of it. Uh, there's a vector of how do you specify a two-dimensional Gaussian distribution? You need two things. You need a vector of means. So what's two-dimensional mean? Intercepts and slopes. A vector of means is the average intercept and the average slope. Right? So two parameters there. And then you need this wonderful thing called a variance-covariance matrix, which you have seen before because in the first half of this course, remember we did quadratic approximation all the time? Remember QAP? QAP is long gone. Right? You've moved on. You've graduated. Uh, but when we were doing QAP, uh, it always represented the posterior distribution as a, using a variance-covariance matrix. It assumed that the, the the posterior distribution was multivariate Gaussian, and it approximated it with this kind of entity. So you've already worked with these things. They're there. It was done automatically for you. Now we're going to be more explicit about it, um, and uh, so you can see what they are in an essence, because we're going to actually estimate them, and we're going to have covariances as part of the posterior distribution now. You having fun yet? Right, turtles all the way down. So we're going to have distributions inside distributions. So what is a variance-covariance matrix? In the two-dimensional case, the simplest one I show you here, it's, uh, it's the multi-dimensional analog of sigma inside a one-dimensional Gaussian distribution. So in a one-dimensional Gaussian distribution, you have this one parameter sigma, which tells you the spread of the measures. If you add more dimensions to the Gaussian distribution, you need a sigma for every dimension, right? Because every dimension could have its own spread. So what does that mean? The intercepts have their own spread, their own sigma. The slopes have their own spread, their own sigma. And then there's another parameter you need, which is the correlation between the two. If you assume that correlation is zero, you could do that. Maybe you get away with it. But in general, it, it doesn't have to be. And so you need three parameters to describe the variance and covariance of two uh, uh, normally distributed variables. And that's what I'm showing you here. They go into this matrix, which is a covariance matrix. And there are two sigmas. There's sigma sub A, which is the standard deviation of the intercepts. And there's sigma sub b, sub beta, which is the standard deviation of the slopes. If you square those, you have variances. And so in the upper left and lower right of this matrix, you've got the variance of each kind of effect. Yeah? The diagonal is the variances in a, in a variance-covariance matrix. And then the off-diagonals are covariances. And in this case, these, uh, these are the same because there's only two uh, effects. This will get bigger later on in a later example. 
And the covariance is the product of the two variances times a correlation coefficient, which I've written here with the Greek letter rho. Yeah, which for completely, I don't know, arcane reasons is always, you, we use this letter. I don't know why. Someone know? Someone's to blame for this, <laughs> right? Uh, it's probably Pearson. So, uh, uh, and if you look in the, in the book, I've got a box to explain why that's true, if you're interested. Uh, there's a very good reason that the covariance is the product of both, of both standard deviations times the regression. It's the definition uh, times the correlation. This is the definition of a correlation. Correlation coefficient is a thing you make up so that the covariance is defined by that expression. That's where it comes from. It's nothing else. The Pearson product moment correlation coefficient is just this thing that makes that the definition of a covariance. You know, there's a box in the book if you're interested in this. Um, you don't have to be interested in it. I totally f uh, forgive you <laughs> if you're not interested. Uh, but if it burns in your mind like it does in mine to, to, to know why, where these expressions come from, I'm here for you. And I've written a box for you. <laughs> OK, let's do some work with this. Um, I'm going to simulate from a population of cafes. Uh, in the book, I give you the code to do this. You can uh, simulate the journey of your, your coffee robot. And it goes around and orders some coffee. And we get a finite sample of morning and afternoon wait times for uh, 20 different cafes on five different days, morning and afternoons. So we've got 10 data points per cafe. That's a very small sample. We're going to do pooling. right? We're going to do some estimation because your, your robot is Bayesian. And you're going to program it with a varying slopes model. In particular, this is your robot's brain. Uh, so let me walk through this step by step. You don't have to get all this at once. We're going to go through this step by step so you understand the programming in the robot and why this is a good brain. Right? There may be better brains, but this is a pretty good one. It's not a bad brain. OK, so of course, you know what the top is. Uh, our outcome variable w is the wait time Yeah, for some cafe. Uh, an observation i. And then we have our linear model. And inside the linear model, we have varying intercepts, an alpha for each cafe, and varying slopes. A, a difference between morning and afternoon for each cafe. And again, there's this dummy variable a sub i, which indicates whether you're in the afternoon. You with me? So when a sub i is 0, this prediction equation is just alpha, just the, the morning weight average. If a sub i is 1, the prediction is alpha plus beta. Right, that's where beta is a difference. It's a slope. You with me? Yeah? Uh, so this is nothing new, right? This, this looks the same as before. Here's the action. So when we do varying slopes and we want to get pooling across the alphas and the betas, we need this multivariate prior now. We don't have two Gaussian adaptive priors. We have one, and it's got both things inside of it now. This is the two-dimensional prior. So we have a, what we say is for each cafe, there's a pair of parameters, alpha and beta, and they're distributed as a two-dimensional normal or MV normal for multivariate normal. Their averages are alpha and beta. And then they have this S thing, which is the covariance matrix that was on the previous slide. Oh, wait, I have labels. Sorry. <laughs> Here are the labels, the things I just said. Uh, so where does this uh, covariance matrix come from? I want to spend a few slides walking through this. Uh, I know for some of you, that my experience with the educational system on, on multiple continents now is that whether or not you have ever done matrix algebra is incredibly random, right? So like if you go through a particular course of study, you'll get linear algebra and you'll know it and you'll be like, why is he teaching us about matrix multiplication? Doesn't everybody know this? And then the person next to you has never seen it before. And it's just even though you both have like PhDs, right? <laughs> so it's just a bizarre thing. So forgive me, I want to spend like five slides just giving you like what is matrix multiplication and how to deal with matrices. And the thing to understand is that these matrices are just matrixes. I'm trying to purge myself of Latin plurals, matrixes. <laughs> um, it sounds pretentious, matrices, right? Matrixes. Uh, matrices are just ways of working with systems of equations. It's just notation. There's no new math in them, actually. It's just a compact bunch of notation so you can do things faster. But if you've never learned the notation, it seems like wizardry. Uh, it's just random stuff happening because uh, it's compressed, right? It's this kind of memory compression. You don't need to write as many things down. But that's all it is. It's just working with systems of equations, which everybody did in secondary school, right? So that's all it is. So let's think about our covariance matrix. And we need to shuffle this thing around because we've got to put 
it has parameters inside of it, and we're gonna have to put priors on those parameters. And there's a strategic way to do this, which works nice uh, for estimation. So we think about, in general, any M by M covariance matrix, a square matrix where M is some dimension. In this case, it's two. It's gonna be four before the end of the day, if I move with pace. And um, this means you need M standard deviations or variances, right? The squares of these will be variances. So in our case, it's two. You need two standard deviations. And you need M squared minus M over two correlations. So for a two by two matrix, this is one, right? Four minus two divided by two is one, yeah? But this goes up. Uh, by the time you go to three or four, you need more and more correlations because there are more and more pairs to consider. So this is just the formula for how many pairs there are, unordered pairs. Um, so in total, you need M times M plus one divided by two parameters, which can get big. Uh, for two by two, it's no big deal, it's three. Uh, but for big matrices, as you'll see, I'll have an example of a four by four uh, later on. You can get a lot. Um, it's still a very small number of parameters compared to the actual varying effects themselves, right? Where you could have hundreds of those, or thousands, if you're ambitious. Um, so how do you put priors on the, all these parameters? Well, there are lots of different conventions. The classical convention is to use a conjugate prior. There's this distribution called the inverse Wishart. Uh, you should not use this. <laughs> You'll see it in textbooks. Uh, it's kind of a classical thing. Its only advantage is that it's conjugate, which means for models with Gaussian outcomes, uh, Gaussian likelihoods and Gaussian priors, there's an analytical result for the posterior. That's what conjugacy gives you. But every other thing about this is bad. Uh, it's a very badly behaved distribution. It does terrible things in terms of regularization. You should not ever use it, <laughs> right? Uh, you'll see old examples. When you come across a model and it's got an inverse Wishart in it, doesn't mean it's a bad model. Just remove the inverse Wishart and do something sensible, okay? This is just how it goes. Um, so, uh, in fact, there's a big literature if you're interested in what's wrong with inverse Wishart priors. It became a thing in the late 90s for statisticians to beat up on the inverse Wishart. So it just kind of like a raft of papers came out uh, slaying the ancestors over this inverse Wishart thing. Um, so it, it's the multidimensional version of the inverse gamma. Uh, so it's better, we can do much better, the practical terms for you as applied, as, as, as applied statisticians Inverse Wishart is annoying because it forces you to simultaneously specify a prior for the correlations and the standard deviations. It's a prior for the whole covariance matrix. Uh, and this is, this is bad because sometimes you have different information about correlations and the standard deviations. So you'd like to be able to assign priors independently to each standard deviation, each sigma, and each correlation coefficient. And you can do this. Uh, but to do this, we're gonna have to factor or decompose the covariance matrix into two separate matrices. Um, so what I'm showing you at the bottom of this slide, our covariance matrix S is equal to this thing on the far left, right? That's just a covariance matrix with the three parameters inside of it. And it turns out that is the product of a diagonal matrix with the two sigmas. That's the, the thing here with the zeros, right? It's a diagonal matrix with the two standard deviations times a correlation matrix uh, R, or that's actually capital Rho, uh, <laughs> capital Greek letter, uh, times the diagonal matrix again. And I know now you're like, if you've had linear algebra, you're like, of course, <laughs> everybody knows that. And if you haven't, you're like WTF. Why is math like this, right? So let me give you a, a little bit of introduction about this. Matrix, matrices, sorry, this is my program to purge myself. I don't care what you say, but I'm just, for me personally, I want to purge myself of Latin plurals. Uh, <laughs> matrices are very nice things. Because uh, they're shortcuts, they're notational shortcuts, they save you some working memory. Uh, and that's why math books are full of them. Uh, matrix comes from the Latin word for mother. Uh, it's a, it means womb <laughs> in late Latin, it means womb. It's the thing something develops in. That's what a matrix is. It's, what, it's the thing something develops in. So it's from mater, right, matrix. And uh, so think about this is, this is where your, your prior, how is prior born? It develops in the matrix, right? <laughs> Um, so there are a few simple rules uh, for multiplying matrices, and these are just ways to deal with systems of equations. And so let me give you, uh, as I said, the, the two-minute, totally unsatisfying version of matrix multiplication, uh, just to demystify it. Your computer will do all this for you. Uh, you don't have to multiply matrices by hand anymore. I don't. Uh, but I want you to have some sense of it if you, if you, you know, 
if you're among the people who just never had linear algebra, which is perfectly fine. It's just depending upon the course of study you do, you won't be taught it. Um, so if you've got two square matrices, which is all we're going to be dealing with in this course, it's incredibly easy. So imagine you've got these two matrix, ma matrixes, sorry, I'm trying, uh, matrices, uh, with capital letters and lowercase letters. And these are just numbers. The capital letters are just some arbitrary numbers and the lowercase letters are just some arbitrary numbers. We want to multiply um, the one on the left here by the one on the top. And what I recommend when you're starting out is you set it up like this. If you multiply two square matrices, matrices, you're going to get a square matrix back. So set it up like this. And then the rule is we consider each square in the answer, each cell in the answer, one at a time. And then you take the row and the column relevant to it. So in the upper left, it's the upper row there, the one as I colored in red, and the left column in the top one. Does that make sense, how you locate those? And then you're going to sweep from left to right in the, in the row and top to bottom in the column. And then in each corresponding sets of positions, you're going to multiply, and then you're going to add all the products together. So what does that mean? We're going to take capital A and multiply it by little a, and then we're going to add that to capital B times lowercase c. And the answer is capital A lowercase a plus capital B lowercase c. And this rule works for every cell. So if you repeat this operation for all the others, you get the answer, right? So for the lower left, now we've got c times lowercase a, we get ca, plus capital D times lowercase c, and that's the answer in the lower left, and so on. And that's it. Now you know how to multiply matrices, right? So as I always joke, if you can make an omelet, you can do linear algebra. Making an omelet is often more challenging <laughs> than linear. Now you're learning about me and not about omelets. But uh, it's, it's really just mechanical stuff. It's just opaque if you've never um, had a course in linear algebra. OK, so this is where we get this decomposition. And sometimes you'll see it written as SRS, that the covariance matrix is SRS, where S is the, this diagonal. It's not an RS on the left. It's the diagonal of the standard deviations times a correlation matrix, where it's uh, uh, one down the diagonal, and then the correlation parameters in the off diagonals, and then again times the diagonal of standard deviations. And I won't spend a lot of time going through this calculation for you, but I wanted to put it in a note so you can follow it in slow motion at home. If you can, you need to do two matrix multiplications, and then you get the original matrix back. So it starts again like this. You set them up. We're going to multiply the first two, the diagonal. Uh, uh, standard deviation matrix times the correlation matrix. So you set them up so the diagonal standard deviation matrix is on the left, correlation matrix is on the top. You need an answer. If you apply that rule, you get this thing back, which is not yet a covariance matrix. It's just an intermediate result. And then you need to put that on the left and put the diagonal standard deviation matrix again on top. One more time with feeling, and you get the covariance matrix back. Yay. I know, it's not exciting, but this is just where it comes from. And again, your computer will do this for you. You don't ever have to do this, right? <laughs> R has a matrix multiplication function that will do this for you whenever you want. Um, computers are good at this stuff. But I just want it not to be magical to you so you understand what's going on. So now uh, we've got this covariance matrix and it's been factored so that we can specify independent priors on the correlations and the standard deviations. And that's why we went through all that nonsense, okay? You're welcome. <laughs> yeah. um, so what do we do with that power now? Well, here's some priors. Um, uh, I won't explain uh, the mean. We need uh, priors for the alpha and beta mean. These are what I call my informed priors. I know something about cafes. I know the average wait time is not zero. right? <laughs> uh, I have expectations, so I'm putting some information in these average priors. And then um, we have three standard deviations in this model, one at the top in the, in the probability of the data, and then a sigma for the intercepts and a sigma for the slopes. The thing we need to spend some time talking about, which is new, is how do you put a prior on a matrix? Now we've got a correlation matrix. And there's only one correlation in this matrix, but in general you could have a correlation matrix which is very big, and it could have a bunch of correlation parameters inside of it. And the truth is you can't assign priors to them independently because there are constraints on correlation matrices. The values cons constrain one another. So I know this is an annoying fact, but this is where, you know, like galaxy brain turns on, right? And you're going to thank me uh, for all this, is that if you only have one correlation in a matrix, well, it can, it can vary between minus one and one, right? Those are all the possible correlation values. 
But now imagine you have two. Uh, and one of them is really, really big. That implies that the other isn't equally large because that would be an impossible matrix, right? If, if, the, if the pairwise correlation between two values is really, really big, that constrains the correlations among the others because the other variables also have to be correlated with those two. As the matrix gets really, really big, those constraints get really strong. Uh, and if you can't, in a big correlation matrix, it's very, very difficult to have strong correlations, in fact, and have a valid population. Uh, you can have a really strong correlation, but then all the others have to be small. Uh, it's a very, it's, it's an absolute fact just about how correlation functions in populations. So you need a family of priors which deal with this fundamental problem that you can't just pick random numbers for the independent correlations and stick them in a matrix and have a valid matrix. There's this thing, some of you will know if you have linear algebra about positive definiteness, right? There's this mathematical constraint that has to do with eigenvalues, which is a way to test this. You don't have to know that. Uh, you just have to know that there are good physical reasons that you can't pick arbitrary correlations inside of a matrix. It's just impossible for everything to be perfectly correlated with everything else in a matrix. Yeah, can't be true. Um, not, not if there's any variation, at least. Okay. <coughs> so there's this really nice uh, family of priors, which I encourage you to use and we use in this book. And you'll see that this is um, present in almost all of the recent textbooks in Bayesian statistics, it's this thing called the LKJ uh, family of, of correlation priors. LKJ is named after the uh, last names of the authors who published the paper. <laughs> uh, uh, this is what people have started calling it. Uh, so Lewandowski, Kurwicka, and Joe. Joe is the guy's last name. I don't forget what his first name is. I hope it's Joe, it's Joseph, <laughs> but I should check. But uh, LKJ, they call it the onion method for setting priors. So maybe we should start calling it the onion prior, which doesn't sound nice. <laughs> but uh, LKJ is what it's called in the software. So you should recognize it as the LKJ prior. How does this prior work? There's one parameter which is determines its shape. This is eta. And eta specifies how concentrated um, uh, the matrix is from the identity matrix. An identity matrix is a matrix with zero correlations everywhere. Just ones along the diagonal and zeros everywhere else. That's called the identity matrix. Why? Because if you multiply a matrix by it, you get the matrix back. That's why it's called the identity matrix. Uh, let's make linear algebra again. You should just think of it as if, if eight is a really, really big number, it means no correlations in the prior. If it's a lower number, then you have a flatter uh, prior on the correlations. And many, many more correlations are possible in the prior. So we, you can visualize this in one dimension quite easily. That's what I've done on this graph. Eta equals one is uniform. So if you look at this graph, I've just, we're thinking about a two by two correlation matrix and putting this prior on it. Now the correlation is unconstrained because there's no other correlation parameter to interfere with it. If eta equals one, you get uniform distribution from minus one to one on the priors, correlations, okay? If it, as you increase it above one, eta above one, you get more and more concentration around zero which is the identity matrix. Uh, so with two, it's this gentle hill. It's mildly skeptical of extreme uh, correlations. Uh, with four, it's a little bit more. If you, as it goes to infinity, you're guaranteed to have no correlations in the posterior. Yeah, and this is the way it works. Uh, for big matrices, all of these uh, prior densities get concentrated more on zero because of these constraints uh, that arise in high dimensions. Um, so in the book, there's code to make this graph, and I encourage you to play with it and get a sense of it. Usually you want to use something that's mildly regularizing, right? You want to be skeptical. Uh, probably the correlation is not minus one or one. That seems implausible, yeah? Uh, however, if the data demands it, uh, this prior doesn't put zero mass anywhere. So if the, if the data demand it, you can get minus one or one uh, out of the posterior. How do we program this? Um, you're used to these formula lists by now. A, little, a bunch of new notation here. I'm going to go through slow and highlight each bit uh, that's new. Um, first thing to note in the linear model, we've got both random intercepts and slopes. I'm calling these alpha cafe cafe. I know that's annoying, but it's just a way to notice that these are the alphas for the cafes. And then bracket cafe is how you get each cafe. Right? There's a vector of alpha cafe parameters, one for each cafe. And then there's beta cafe for each cafe as well. That's just your linear model. And then the way, um, there actually there are a number of different ways to program these, these multi-normal priors, and you'll see a few before we're done this week. 
Uh, but here's the most transparent one that I want to start with. You can just use this C combiner to make a vector and you can put uh, the alpha cafe and beta cafe parameter vectors together. This is like making a two column list. And then for each cafe, again, the bracket goes on the end. So each row in this uh, two column matrix of, of parameters corresponds to each cafe. Right? So you say the way to read this maybe in, in plain language is to say uh, the bracket cafe means for each cafe. So for each cafe, there's a pair of, of parameters, alpha cafe and beta cafe. Good? Yeah? Again, uh, uh, from the lecture, you can get the concepts of this, but you really got to go home and draw the owl, you know, and run the code and get some sense of what's going on. Uh, then we write multi-normal instead of normal. Yeah? And uh, then you can put a vector of means. That's A and B, or just the means uh, for the intercepts and slopes. And then we put in here our correlation matrix row, and then a vector of sigma, sigma cafe, which will have the same length. So row automatically, when you do this, the multinormal prior here knows that row should be two by two because there are two means and there are two outcomes. And it knows that sigma has to be length two, and it sets that up for you. Then the rest of the priors are things you've seen before. And then for the LKJ correlation, it's just LKJ underscore core. And then two, two is that mild hill I showed you on the previous slide, right? Eta equals two. So it's mildly skeptical of extreme correlations. Very mild, as it turns out. You with me so far? Um, oh yeah, so I, was, I had some more highlighting. Here you go. <laughs> All right, so rho and sigma, yeah. There's rho and there's sigma. There's their, their correspondence. So yeah, it, it uh, when this builds the stand code, it knows that sigma cafe has to be a vector of length two because of the multinormal has two elements in it. Right? It does it automatically for you. You don't have to write it here. But I'll show you later a case where we can specify the length manually because we can, we, we're going to have to. But for now, just know it's doing it automatically. All right, when you run this model, what happens? Let's look at the posterior distribution for the correlation, actually, uh, first. And then I'll show you its consequence. So we run the model, this is model 14.1 in chapter 14, extract the posterior as usual, then I plot the density for this correlation matrix. And when you look inside the posterior, you're gonna see a matrix row, and it's gonna have four cells, right? But here I'm showing you the density for one, two, that is, it's got rows and columns. So for row one, column two, and that's the correlation position. Uh, one, one is always one, right? Because this is a correlation matrix. And two, two is always one, because it's a correlation matrix. But 1, 2, and 2, 1 are the same value. But they're all inside the posterior because we sampled a matrix. Yeah? It's a distribution of matrices, matrices. Uh, and so I'm showing you this is the correlation parameter of interest. The um, black dashed density is our prior. That's our eta equals 2 LKJ correlation prior, gentle hill. And then the blue is the posterior distribution. There's almost all the mass is below 0. There's a negative correlation between these two things. Why? Because I simulated it to be that way, right? But we'll see examples of, of natural correlation structures, yeah, in data. Does this make some sense? What's the consequence of this? Well, you get pooling in two dimensions now, uh, or shrinkage in two dimensions. So what I've plotted up on this slide is on the horizontal are the intercept estimates for each cafe, on the vertical are the slope estimates for each cafe, and I've drawn this like a statistical population. So again, the blue points, like last week, are the raw data values. They're the fixed effect estimates. If you just took only the data for that individual cafe and naively did the averaging, ignoring the rest of the sample, this would be your estimate. So-called raw, unregularized, fixed effect estimate. Uh, the open circles are the varying effect estimates we get out of the posterior distribution of this model. Now, let's spend some quality time with this graph, okay? We don't, we're, we, we, we're not in a hurry. So, uh, first thing you notice is I've drawn all these ellipses on here. What are these? These ellipses are the contours of the inferred population. So that multivariate normal distribution that's in the model, the prior, it, is, it has been learned from the data because the alpha and beta means and the covariance matrix weren't known. But now we have a posterior distribution for them, so we have a posterior distribution for this population of cafes. And I've plotted the contours of that population in, with these ellipses. 
you want to know how to do this, the code's in the book. There's a library called ellipse in R, and it does this for you, basically. You give it a covariance matrix, it draws ellipses. It's very easy, right? Any Gaussian, two-dimensional Gaussian distribution implies an ellipse at any, at any level that you're interested in. And so you can just draw it as a bunch of concentric ellipses. Um, so I'll show these at, at the 10, 30, uh, 50 is the median, right? 80 and 99 uh, uh, percentile contours of this Gaussian hill that the cafes are in. And this is the statistical population that generates pooling or shrinkage in the population of cafes, but now in two dimensions. So remember how shrinkage works is if there's an estimate that's really extreme from the, from the perspective of the prior, then it gets shrunk towards the mean. Now we're in two dimensions, and now that shrinkage works in two dimensions. So one of the cool consequences of this is that we can highlight particular cafes, like the one that I've drawn uh, the red uh, oval around, and notice the thing about that cafe that's interesting is uh, it's got a very typical intercept. Right? Its intercept, which is located on the horizontal axis, is right in the middle of the population. It's exactly what you'd expect. It's a perfectly boring average cafe in terms of morning wait time. But its slope is unusual. It's very extreme. It's out on the edges of the population. Right? It's towards the top of this graph. Since it has an extreme slope, the model is skeptical of that and it shrinks it towards the mean slope. But it also knows that slopes and intercepts are correlated in this population. They're negatively correlated. So when it shrinks the slope, it also changes the intercept. And it moves the intercept to the right. And that's why as you follow the shrinkage line from the blue point to the open circle, you go down and to the right. right. So even though the intercept is not extreme, Statistically, the optimal thing to do turns out to be to adjust it because of the correlation structure between the two features. Are you excited? <laughs> Brenda's excited. Thank you, Brenda. <laughs> so this is a cool thing. It's, and why is this good? Uh, this is helping you reduce overfitting. Right? The correlation structure is there, and you shouldn't ignore it if you want to learn optimal. <coughs> um, now, you can go through, you can tour through a bunch of these cafes and understand what's going on, why some are shrinking and some aren't. Right, uh, where, uh, uh, where they are, but you see there's still the general shrinkage pattern that dominates it, is that extreme, the further any cafe is from the center of this distribution, uh, the more it moves. That's the shrinkage phenomenon. But now they're being drawn towards some kind of uh, contour there that goes through the, the angled middle of this distribution. Um, you can represent this both on the parameter scale, which is what we've just done, or on the outcome scale. You transform this, right? You can add the slopes to the intercepts, and then you can get another version of the posterior distribution where you've got a, uh, a parameter for each cafe, which is the morning weight, and a parameter for each cafe, which is the afternoon weight. You can always do that. So I, I show you all the code to do this in the text, and then you get the graph on the right. It's the same shrinkage distribution. You've still got shrinkage, all the same phenomenon, but now there's a positive correlation. But notice that we're below the diagonal of equality. That is, you expect to wait more in the morning than you do in the afternoon everywhere. But there's a correlation between the two, right? You wait more both in the morning and the afternoon at particular cafes. But everything's still being shrunk towards the middle, right? Because shrinkage is working for you. Good? And you don't have to get it all right now. I just want you to get enough of the concept so you can go home and draw the owl, right? OK. Let me try to summarize this a little bit. Uh, what we're exploiting here is multi-dimensional shrinkage. Uh, when you have a joint distribution of varying effects parameters, you can pool information across the types of parameters. And this is even better than pooling in within one type of parameter. But this depends upon the correlation between the effects. If there's no evidence for correlation between the effects in the data, you don't get pooling across the types. So you still got to learn it from the data. Um, and it has all the same advantages of, of pooling in general. Okay, let me try to uh, show you a grown-up version of this. Let's consider many effects, many types of clusters. Well, two types of clusters. That's many, right? Two is many. In this class, two is many. Uh, so let's go back to the chimpanzees data. I know you're sick of this data by now. I'm not. I love this data set <laughs> with all my heart. And it's like I know each of these chimpanzees. I actually know their names, but I'm trying to anonymize them. Right. <laughs> um, 
these chips appear in multiple papers, actually. So you like start to recognize Lefty in multiple papers. <laughs> but uh, so uh, there are four treatments in this in this experiment. Remember, because uh, there are two treatment factors, so to speak, and we combine them factorially. You've got the partner presence and absence, and you've got which side of the table the prosocial option is on. We've got four treatments, and we're trying to estimate the the uh, average behavior in each of these treatments. But the, the treatment, how often the left-hand lever is pulled in each treatment can vary both by actor and block. So let's think about this as a big varying effects model where we consider the, the effects of both actor and block on the four treatment effects. So where we're going to express this now at the bottom, uh, the outcome is still 0, 1, whether the uh, individual pulled the left lever. And now we've got four mean treatment effects, which I'm going to call gamma. TID is your treatment ID from one to four. There are four different treatments. In each treatment, there's an average rate of pulling the left lever across all chimpanzees and blocks. But each chimpanzee in each block has a deviation from that mean. And we're going to estimate that as a parameter now. And that's what the next two bits in the linear model are. We've got a, a matrix of effects now alpha. I know this is going to get fun, right? But it's all the stuff you already know. It's just the notation is the challenge. So alpha sub actor i comma TID i. What does that mean? The alpha deviation from the mean in this treatment for actor i in this treatment. Right, so for each actor in each treatment, there's a deviation. So we're letting each actor's behavior vary by each treatment. So each actor gets four parameters, right? Because there are four treatments. And there are, how many actors? Seven? Is that right? Seven or eight? It'll show up on a later slide and embarrass me. So let's say seven. <laughs> There's seven actors, so we've got seven times four parameters here. Seven times four alphas. And then we have beta parameters for the block effects. These are the deviations from the mean, the gamma means for each treatment per each block. So each block gets its own deviation for each treatment. So there are four parameters for each block. I think there are six blocks in this data set, so six times four block parameters. We want to do some shrinkage, right? It's a lot of parameters. There's a lot of data here, but we want to do some shrinkage. Are you with me on the structure? So this is like the rawest empirical description of this data set yet. We're saying for every little box that's got a unique identity, there's a unique block and treatment and actor, that combination, we're going to let it have its own deviation, which comes from the sum of these parameters, right? So it's like a really raw uh, empirical description of the, of the variation in the experimental data. But we're going to need to do some shrinkage to deal with overfitting. So let's count up parameters. We've got um, one matrix for each cluster type, that is actor and block. So there's going to be two covariance matrices, matrixes in this uh, model. So we get 7 times 4, it was 7. 7 times 4 equals 28 actor parameters. 6 times 4 equals 24 block parameters. Each of these covariance matrix matrixes has six correlations and four sigmas. And, and to prove this to you, I've drawn a four by four correlation matrix in the lower right in the abstract, and the diagonal is all ones, right? Because each variable is perfectly correlated with itself. Yeah, at least in this universe. And the off diagonals are the pairs. And there are one, two, three, four, five, six unique pairs. And these matrix, matrices are always symmetric, right? So the upper triangle and the lower triangle are the same. Make sense? So we've got six correlation parameters now to estimate. Good times. Uh, so there are 10 parameters per correlation matrix. In, in some here, we've got 28 plus 24 plus 20 plus 4 is 76 parameters to estimate. No problem. Hamiltonian Monte Carlo laughs at this. This is not a challenge at all. It's just warming up. This is breakfast for Hamiltonian Monte Carlo. Yeah. So we could do thousands, no problem. We've also got all, the, all, yeah, all these other parameters we could have if we had more individuals. Say you had 100 chimpanzees, right? Then you get lots of alphas. Uh, in the notation, you think about these multivariate normals this way. There are, for each actor J, there's alpha 1, 2, 3, and 4 for each of the treatments. Um, the means are all zero because the means are going to be the gammas that are in the linear model. And then we've got this covariance matrix uh, depicted on the right to estimate. This is what the code looks like. <clears throat> I'm going to walk through this step by step again. Um, the first bit to notice are the actor effects shown in red here. In the linear model, we've got our matrix of alphas, actor, comma, TID. You want to think about the alphas as a matrix where each row is an actor and each column is a treatment. Yeah? And that's why it's alpha, comma, treatment. I mean, actor, comma, treatment. 
And that gives us the cell that goes on this particular outcome. Does that make sense? Enough sense to keep going? Yes, okay, thank you. Uh, and then we define it down in the adaptive priors um, as a vector of four treatment effects, uh, one for each actor. That's what they say. So vector four means I want four treatment effects. I'm going to call this parameter alpha, and there's going to be one of these for each actor. And this is what defines the matrix. So what is the matrix? It's four things right, times the number of actors. So this is what gives you the number of actors times the number of, of treatments as a matrix. It's just a weird way to think about it, I know. But this is, this is the way multivariate normals are often uh, conceptualized. So they're a collection of vectors. right? There's a vector of four parameters for each actor. It's one way to think about this. Um, and then there's this multinormal thing again. The mean is zero. Uh, there's a single zero in the code here, but it knows that there are four elements in this. Why? Because you said vector four. <laughs> yeah, and so it, it multiplies the four. It repeats it four times. And then there's row actor and sigma actor. It knows that that needs to be a four by four matrix. Um, and it knows that sigma actor needs to be a vector of length four. And then those get defined as priors down before. Uh, sigma actor, exponential prior on each element of it. And then row actor is this LKJ core prior. Here with our notation with the D in front. And I made eta four, so it's a little bit more skeptical of extreme correlations. You with me? The only new bit here is this matrix thing and the vector notation. Um, and now the same thing for the blocks. It's really just the same thing with beta replacing alpha everywhere, right? Or block replacing actor. So up in the top, now we've got a matrix of betas. Each row is a block. Each column is a treatment. Same thing for the adaptive prior. Now there's block instead of actor. And, uh, but again, it's for each block, there's a vector of four parameters that are drawn with this particular correlation structure. So here's the idea to think about this scientifically. The, the different treatment effects have a correlation across actors and blocks. Right, they have an association with one another. That's the correlation structure you're going to estimate. What does that correlation structure mean? We'll look at this. That's the handedness. When you're talking about actors, it's handedness. Right? So if you're really, really, say you're lefty, actor number two, you're always pulled a left lever. Uh, there's a correlation among the treatment effects there. Right? They're all high. <laughs> yeah. And handedness generates correlation in the actor effects in this data set. I'll show you that when we get to plot that correlation structure. So there's really, really strong correlations, actually, in the covariance matrix for actors that we're going to estimate. And it arises from handedness. In block, there's nothing, because there are no block effects in these data. But it, you got to see when there's nothing, right, uh, as well. Because sometimes there really is nothing, often in my data sets. <laughs> OK, so uh, sigma block and then again LKJ core. Uh, now, with these models, is I think part of learning is you want to uh, run this model and understand it and then come back and gradually make these LKJ core uh, priors stronger. You're going to have to make that number really big before you have much of an impact here. Uh, but you should play with it. Try 64, 128. Make it a big number. And then see what happens to the posterior. And that's the way you get a sense about how strong these things are. Um, since you can't plot a four-dimensional matrix, right? No one can do that. No one's got galaxy brains <coughs> and can do this, uh, right? So you know the joke. I think I told it already in this course. You've got like a 14-dimensional matrix. How do you visualize that? Well, you plot a two-dimensional or three-dimensional matrix, and then you stare at it hard, and you say 14, right? <laughs> and uh, no one can do this. It's just no one knows what these things look like. Uh, so um, OK, uh, I've got five minutes. But let me get this topic started. This is one of my favorite topics in the course. Uh, so divergences again, right? We spent time last week talking about divergent transitions. Remember the roller coaster pops off the rail? OK, the roller coaster really pops off the rail with these models a whole lot. <laughs> uh, it really likes to. So you're going to have to use the non-centered formalization quite often. Well, you know, not that you have to. You should. It makes the sampling more efficient. You'll have a lot more confidence in the results. Um, and so you'll see here we get 96 divergences, right? Uh, the, the cognitive challenge, though, is remember, to do a non-centered parameterization, what you do is you factor all of the parameters out of the prior into the linear model. So for a one-dimensional normal, that's easy. Right, because uh, there's just there's a mean you can take that out and stick it in the linear model. There's a sigma you can factor that out and multiply it back in in the linear model. You're done. It's not a big deal. Once you've seen it a few times, it's it's second nature. But now we've got a whole matrix. Uh, so the sigmas aren't a problem again. We can just factor those out and put them back in as before. But you still got a correlation matrix 
inside the prior? How do you put a matrix in a linear model? And the answer is this fellow, Andre Louis Koleski or Scholeski. Koleski here in Germany, we say Koleski. <laughs> and it's a Polish name, right? So we can say however we like, right? Only with this. <laughs> but uh, uh, this is a fellow who did an amazing thing. Uh, it figured out a really uh, cool trick for solving systems with linear equations, and we can use it to put an entire correlation matrix in a single linear model, and that's how we do this. Uh, now, your computer will do it for you, uh, but let me spend a little bit of time saying uh, a little bit about the background, because you know, part of the, one of the themes in this course is I like to tell you about random mathematicians, right? It's just a hobby with me. So this is part of the, the, the history of the science part. So this is this fellow uh, Koleski is really interesting because. He, his work was pu published posthumously, but it's an incredibly famous bit of work, which has had a huge impact on applied mathematics in lots of fields. This is a workhorse thing, the so-called Koleski factor or Koleski decomposition. It's a standard thing. Everybody learns it. We use it daily, all the time. It saves your bacon and lets you get these non-centered forms. And uh, it's a cool story in the sense that, um, so he was an artillery officer in uh, the First World War, as it says here, the, the Great War, right? Uh, where is it in, the, yeah. Grand Guerre, right, it's, uh, in the Great War, and he died in the war. But his colleagues rescued his notes, where he had solved on the battlefield, basically, a way to solve systems of linear equations. And the cool thing about this is that, about this technique is, it's a way to solve a system of linear equations by solving fewer equations than you started with. Uh, and that's what makes it work. It's a really cool, efficient thing. Um, this paper is, is great fun, by the way. <laughs> it's written by his colleague. Um, and uh, so uh, why do we care about this? You don't feel like you're solving systems of linear equations. What you're doing is you've got this correlation matrix and you need to somehow um, factor it out and, or rather you want to blend it somehow with a vector of z-scores. Remember, this is the non-centered uh, uh, prior business. You've just got a bunch of z-scores, independent z-scores on your, on your parameters. And then you want to blend those somehow with a correlation matrix and get things back out on the right scale. So this is what his technique lets us do. Uh, here's a, a little bit of R code which shows you in a two-dimensional case how it can work. Um, and I'll walk you through this and then I'll show you the automated version for bigger uh, things. You never have to do this by hand. Uh, it's just matrix algebra. So imagine, for example, we wanted to simulate two vectors of random numbers that have a particular correlation structure. How would you do that? Just say, you just want to do this all the time, right? If you're like me, you do. This is a common problem. But you want random numbers and you want them to be correlated in a particular way. Well, it turns out you can just simulate independent vectors of random numbers. That's what I'm doing here. So I'm going to say, at the top, we want 10,000 random numbers. We want the, the standard deviation of the first uh, of the random numbers to be two, the standard deviation of the second kind of random number to be a half. And I want their correlation to be 0.6. OK? How can I do this in a computer? And Koleski to the rescue, this is how we do it. Um, we imagine ourselves on a French battlefield in World War I, and we solve a geodetic network. This is what he was doing. He was, he was a geographer, right? And um, artillery officer, right? And so uh, Z1 is just a bunch of Z-scores, 10,000 of them. And Z2 is a bunch of Z-scores, 10,000 of them. Totally random. No correlation between Z1 and Z2 at all. And then... Of course, we can get A1 as a function of Z1 to have the right standard deviation by multiplying it by sigma. That's the second to last line. Does that make sense? Right? If it's Z scores, you multiply by standard deviation, it's on the normal scale again. It has the variance you want. Um, and then in the last line, this is this thing, the Koleski factor. And I know this is a bizarre expression. You don't have to understand it. You just know that this is a consequence of doing this calculation that Koleski discovered um, in the service of the military in World War I, uh, that you can do this weird thing with rho and z1 in there, and then multiply at the end by sigma 2, and then I just show you at the bottom, the correlation between z1 and z2 is 0. That's 0 in a computer, right? <laughs> uh, that first long number there. The correlation between a1 and a2 is 0.6, which is what we wanted. This works, and it works for any size matrix. So we can have any number of z's here, z1, z2, z3, z4, z100, and pick any correlation structure we like, and apply this technique generalized up to that, and get things back on the scale we want. This is how we do the non-centered parameterization in this business. So it's 11 o'clock, so I'll stop right here at this, at this thing. When you come back, we'll pick up on this slide. Uh, we'll do this in an automated fashion, and I want to show you the code to do it. Then we'll get rid of divergent transitions, and then we'll talk about lefty again. Okay. So thank you. I'll see you on Friday.